morning and welcome to the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. My name is Zena Azam. I'm the executive director of the place and I'm delighted to welcome you to this breakfast meeting with two very special guests. We're delighted to have Dr. Yasser Abu Jame, executive director of the Gaza Community Mental Health Program and Ron Goldstein, who's the executive director for Physicians for Human Rights, Israel, which are with us today. They are on a tour this month at the invitation of Rebuilding Alliance, the Gaza Mental Health Foundation, and a number of medical institutions, universities, faith groups, and advocates, including Seattle Physicians for Social Responsibility, Psychologists for Social Responsibility, Harvard School of Public Health, the Palestine Children's Relief Fund, and Jewish Voice for Peace. The tour closes these last few days of October here in Washington, D.C., with meetings at the State Department as well as a congressional briefing. I'd like also to welcome two guests who are traveling with, with our speakers. Dr. William Slaughter is the chair of the Gaza Mental Health Foundation, who's sitting up here in the front. And uh, Donna Baranski Walker, who's the founder and executive director of Rebuilding Alliance, a nonprofit dedicated to rebuilding war-torn communities and bringing the world together to make them safe. Thank you, Donna, for doing all the organizing and being so cheerful and, and helping us so much. Our two guests will discuss the mental health crisis for children in Gaza and of the whole population there. We know that years of an economic blockade and three devastating wars since 2008 have wreaked havoc on the physical and psychological well-being of the people in Gaza. A huge number of residents have lost many, many family members to these wars, including most of the people in the Gaza Community Mental Health Program and Dr. Abu Jamer himself. Our speakers will have the floor for 20 minutes each, after which we will open the discussion. Viewers online can tweet questions to us at at Palestine Center. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Dr. Yasser Abu Jame, MD, MSc, is Executive Director of the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. He brings a special interest in neuropsychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, advocacy, and policy change to the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, which was founded in 1990 by Dr. Iyad Sarraj and is the leading Palestinian non-governmental organization providing mental health services to people living in the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Community Mental Health Program is committed to aiding women, children, victims of violence, torture, and human rights violations. Ron Goldstein is executive director and strategist of Physicians for Human Rights Israel which is an Israeli NGO that stands at the forefront of the struggle for human rights, in, particularly, in particular, the right to health in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. Previously, he served as spokesman for the International Committee of the Red Cross in Israel. The PHR Israel works to promote a society that is based on the values of human rights, solidarity, social justice, equality, and mutual assistance for all populations under Israel's responsibility. I'll ask Ron Goldstein to speak first, after which Dr. Yasser Abu Jama will take his turn. Thank you, and welcome. Good man morning, everyone, and thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here, especially now during uh, another you know, another, um, you know, Palestinians, it, it always, but now also Israelis feel this tension which comes in, in our region. Um, I will go and a little bit explain what we do as Physician for Human Rights in the last 27 years, and then I will go and uh, more in depth about the closure, implementation of the closure and the permit system. So if it's fine with you, I will start. So Physician for Human Rights, uh, as Zainab said, uh, we were established in, 2000, in 1988. Uh, it was a group of doctors who decided to go, uh, led by Ruhama Marathon, psychiatrist, 
who in the first intifada decided to go to Gaza and see how people live there under occupation and during the intifada. And what they found out is not only that the fact that people need a lot of help, people need humanitarian support, they also said that, okay, we're doctors, so we understand how to deliver aid to people, but we need also to think about policy change. So the idea behind Physician for Human Rights is from one hand, we give humanitarian support, we give services to population, different population in Israel and in occupied territories, but we also work on policy change. Um, and la uh, third thing we do is working uh, on, on education issues, meaning that we see the medical community in Israel as one of our target audience. So we have, and we talk about the r relations between human rights and the right to health and how is it implemented in the daily medical services they give in hospitals. I'll go to that in a minute, but I'll just say that one of the most important part of what we do is to mobilize the medical community in Israel, not only to be good doctors, good nurses, good, good uh, pharmacists, also to be people who are also care about um, activism. Uh, don't see someone who come to you only as a detainee, but is your patient. And this is something that we see it more and more every week, almost every day. We see how the medical community in Israel, unfortunately, becoming in line more and more with the policy of the government, the, the security uh, authorities. I'll get to that in a minute. And there are also success stories. So um, <laughs> we, we do see some small victories sometimes. Um, what do we do? So we have a mobile clinic. Mobile clinic meaning that every weekend we have a group of uh, medical staff who goes to the West Bank every weekend to different place. We go with a bus. We take a place, public, public place like this one or a school or something like that. We open. And then, you know, it depends on how many doctors we have, but between five to ten doctors every week. And then we start and see people. The average number of people is around three hundred people every weekend and the main thing people need is not only the to see the doctors but medications we see that there is a lack of access for medications uh, sometimes it's because people just don't have money sometimes it's because they cannot afford themselves to go from the village which is in area C uh, to Ramallah to see a doctor or to buy the, the medication um, so medication part is very, very, every, every weekend we give medications in amount of $1,500. Um, uh, and some of the cases we also refer people to hospitals in Israel. Uh, many times it's people, you know, the doctors who see them refer them to themselves in hospital later on for medical checks and things that we cannot do in the mobile clinic. The mobile clinic also goes to Gaza. We are the only Israeli organization which goes to Gaza on a regular basis. Every five, between five to seven weeks, we have a group of doctors which enter Gaza, performing surgeries in hospitals, also doing training. Uh, also the surgery, surgeries that they perform is, has a very important training part in it because they do it with the local staff, of course, so they try to train them. Um, part of this training is also when we try to bring people from Gaza to Israel from training and it didn't work in the last years, last couple of years, but before I just arrived here a week before we succeeded to facilitate exit of 11 doctors for uh, three days, three days training in one of the Israeli hospitals and it was very unique and also we realized how much the, ba the gap is huge in knowledge. One of the doctors told me, you know, in five years there will be no doctor in Gaza who will know to do an IV because all the good doctors left. And we're talking about a system, health system in Gaza that the electricity runs something like 12 hours a day and all the rest the hospitals are <coughs> using generators. We're talking about a medical system that have no medications, no disposables, 
Um, and, and according to the Ministry of Health, the Palestinian Ministry of Health, we're talking about a $4 million gap for a day. They need $4 million a day to be able to rebuild the health system in Gaza. <coughs> During the last war, we organized a fact-finding mission, eight international experts who went into Gaza during the war and then also after the war, and we published a report, you can find it online, uh, under a um, Gaza health attack. And the experts were uh, people from Europe, people for, two of them were from the States, one of them was the, she is the Professor Jennifer Lanning, if you heard her name, she is the head of the health public school in Harvard. And they found out many things, but one of the things that really terrify us is the fact that the hospitals could not cope with the number of the wounded. So sometimes people who were seriously wounded were put with the bodies. And I'm not talking about regular patients who didn't have any solutions, someone who just had a heart attack, some, uh, someone who need a chronic, someone who has chronic problems, those people could not find any way to get treatment during the 51 days of war because the hospitals and all the medical facilities were dealing with wounded uh, people. And we're talking about more than 11,000 wounded in a strip which is very small, as you know. Um, and the mobile clinic, I, I said we do also policy changes of many times from the mobile clinic or from the fact that we help people in Gaza to go out to the West Bank, Jordan, or, or Israel for medical um, care, we learn about the phenomenon. Meaning that um, someone who wants to leave Gaza, you know, every one of us who goes to a doctor sometimes wants to see a um, second opinion. In Gaza, they can't. Because if you want to leave Gaza for a medical check, you need first to prove that this medical um, service does not exist in Gaza. And okay, we prove that it's not exist, then you have the security issue. And with the security issue, if you are 18 to 45 years old and you are a man, it's very difficult to get a permit to leave. So in those cases, we intervene and 50% 50 50 of the cases that we intervene, we succeed to change the decision of the authority. So suddenly someone who just until yesterday was security prevented, suddenly he got the green light and he can go out for a medical check. We see in that as a proof that all this system is not really about security. We think that all this system is about control and as Maybe we'll get to that in a bit later. This, you know, disclosure that was implemented from 2007 obviously failed. Even if you think from the Israeli, you know, point of view. Like, why did they do disclosure, okay? Except for the fact that it's immoral and, um, you know, it's collective punishment and everything, all that. They did it because they thought that with the closure, there will be more pressure on Hamas. And then, you know, there will be a revolution in Gaza or whatever. And uh, it will be easier for, for Israel probably to, I don't know, negotiate, whatever. But what we see is exactly the opposite. We see that now you have other groups, not only Hamas. Um, you see that the people in Gaza are the, the ones who s really suffer. They're the civilians. So... After so many years of closure, I think Israel, except of being, and you know, talk another, the, continue with the same policy of security that will bring another war probably, need to change completely the policy of the closure. You know, um, before the closure in 2000 and before 2007, every month half a million people used to leave Gaza per month. You know how many people live now Gaza? More or less, um, you know, more or less, it's 10,000 people a month. So we see that the closure really affects the civilians in Gaza. Um, I will go to that in a minute again. Uh, I have still 10 minutes. 
So just in general to, uh, to, to go about other things within Physician for Human Rights, so we have another clinic in Tel Aviv, which is in Jaffa actually, open clinic. Everyone who, has, who doesn't have Israeli national health insurance can come and get treatment. So it's mostly for refugees, asylum seekers who live in Israel who have no access to medical care. It's also for uh, Palestinians who marry to an Israelis and don't have access to medical care because, you know, there, there is this civilian law in Israel, um, which means that if you're a Palestinian who married an, an Israeli Palestinian, you will not get a citizenship. Unless you do, there is a special humanitarian committee, but it's very difficult to get a really legal status. So people sometimes live 30 years, 40 years in Israel. They have, they have Israeli kids who has insurance. And the partner, mo most of the time it's a man who has insurance, but the wife doesn't. And she lives like that for years and years and years. And we are the only place she can come and get treatment. Um, and what do we do when, you know, it's not just uh, she, when she needs a surgery, thing like that. So then in Israel, if you are, um, your situation deteriorated, and you go to hospital, they must give you treatment. Never mind if you have insurance, doesn't have insurance, they will deal with the, how the patient will pay later on. So some people get the treatment, get insurance, but then rehabil uh, rehabilitation is something that they don't have. So we many times intervene with the Ministry of Health and we succeed that they will, uh, you, they will take responsibility for something that usually they don't do. But it's, you know, we say that everyone who lives in Israel, that Israel is his main base for many years, should have Israel uh, national health insurance. It makes not only sense, again, like the closure, it's not only more moral, it's also m economically make more sense. Because then when you have the prevention, you know, care, so people not deteriorate, that then they don't go to hospital, then you don't need to hospitalize them for a long time, then it costs less money to the states. But I assume it will take a little bit more time to convince the Israel authorities to do that, but we're working on it. Another thing, it's regarding the medical community. This is a campaign we did with our doctors, volunteers, that saying they will refuse to the, uh, I don't know if anyone reads Hebrew here, but this is a campaign saying that refusing to obey the force feeding law. Force feeding law was just passed uh, two months, uh, three months ago in aim to uh, force feed uh, Palestinian hunger strikers uh, because in the last four or five years there is a phenomenon, by the way it happened in the 80s and 90s already, but in the five years we see it happen more and more that Palestinians who are under administrative arrest protest their arrest in a force, f in a hunger strike. So Israel, in aim to deal with that, said, okay, we will allow doctors, because Israel doesn't really fear from the fact that somebody will die from this hunger strike. So they passed a law that will allow doctors to force feed. Never mind, by the way, that at least two patients in the 80s who were force feed died from the force feeding process, which is very risky as well. <laughs> um, so now they think this is the solution. And uh, we were very happy that the medical community in Israel, at least, was very vocal and strong against it. Even the Israeli Medical Association um, um, did a really good job, public job, against this bill. But what we see in other cases, probably you are aware with this photo. Most of the people, what do you see in this photo? Just shout. Handcuffed. His face beaten. Okay, this is Ahmed Nansara. He's a 13 years old boy that accused to be to stab an Israeli boy. Also 13 years old. He was. Um, I don't know exactly what happened. And, you know, his case is is going to be in court soon, but. He was also uh, shot by an Israeli people and he was taken to hospital. Then Mahmoud Abbas in uh, last week, it uh, no, it was when I was in Israel, so two weeks ago, 
did a public speech and said that this boy was killed by Israel. Israel, in aim to show that, to prove that he is not dying and get treatment in hospital, published this photo. They published a photo of 13 years old boy, hospitalized, under arrest, shackled to the bed. You see here that he's shackled to the bed and violated all the legal, all the protections law on minors. They didn't ask his parents. They didn't ask his lawyer. Even the hospital, of course, was against this publication of the photo. But in the propaganda war, and there is a propaganda war between the two sides, Israel violated every single moral um, point of it. So we uh, use that in aim to show the world, in aim to uh, criticize Israel. We uh, distributed a press release against it, of course. But we accept, we expect from doctors in hospital to go and intervene with the guards about the fact that he's shackled to the bed. Because, th by the way, there is at least one guard with him. And, you know, and I'm sorry for the next photo. It's tougher than that. Also here, he's a 17 years old. Never mind what he did or didn't or whatever. We don't deal with what they did or not. He's in hospital, he's a patient. If he's your patient, you need to take care that he will not be shackled. And you know, you see one leg is injured, the other leg is also with, you know, something which with abundant or something. He will not escape. In this case, he had two guards in the room. And we want the medical community to be more involved also with those issues. And, um, I'm skipping that. And, and from, some, from time to time, we get phone calls from hospitals saying, you know, just now the, the ISA, Israel Security Authorities, Shabak, took one room and they interrogate the patient. So sometimes we do have these kind of calls and then we intervene immediately. But most of the time, if doctor sees someone who was beaten, and he's in detention, he's not only Palestinians, by the way, also Israelis or Jewish detainees. They don't speak with the patients, they speak with the guard. They give the guard the medical checks, they give the, secure, the prison authorities, you know, the permission, okay, you can go back to interrogation. And this is not the role of doctors. Doctors should protect the patients. And this is something that we go to universities, we go to um, hospitals to speak with different people. Uh, it's not very easy because, as you know, in the last, um, let's say, since Castled, I think, uh, the respect for human rights organization is less in Israel, and uh, we've been attacked all the time, and there will be new laws that will probably hold our the way how we fund ourselves, but we will deal with that later on when they will pass the law. I will finish with... Just another example for permit issues. Um, Ayman is from Gaza. His wife is an Israeli, and he wanted to be in the birth of his son. So we ask for a permit, as every Gazan person should do when he wants to leave Gaza, because they cannot plan their life. They cannot go to travel for holidays. They cannot study abroad. They cannot visit their family in the West Bank. They need first to get a permit to to exit and this permit process always take two, three weeks. Then when he was security prevented, he contact us. We intervene and very happily we succeed to get him a permit. It was five months after his baby was already de delivered. So, but, but also there is a small victory in this story because since then the rule changed and Palestinians who married Israelis and they are going to have a baby will allow to um, go with them to the hospital in Israel. So it's a small victory. Probably will not make change for many people. But still, we, can, we, we see that we succeed to change from time to time also the policy somehow. So thank you very much. My time is over, as I can see from there. Um, so probably we'll have more questions later. And I want to invite the, my partner for this trip, Yasser Abu Jamal, that 
Um, actually, our cooperation, cooperation of the organization goes from the first day. Muhammad Martin, the one who established the Physician for Human Rights, went to Gaza, and one of the people she met was Iyad Sarach, who back then was the only psychiatrist in Gaza. And two years after, he established Gaza Mental Health Community Program, um, which now, and Dr. Saraj passed away, when was it, two years ago? And now Yasser Abu Jami very successfully went into his big shoes and is now the executive director of the organization, so welcome. Sabah al khair and good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ran, for the nice introduction, and I would like to start by thanking the Palestinian Center for uh, arranging this event. Uh, I, I don't know from where to start. I am sure that uh, most of the uh, uh, audience are well acquainted with the uh, Gaza Strip. You know, it's one tiny space there on that map. Do you see where is Gaza Strip in there? Well, it's painted in yellow, I think, you know, but it's uh, just right next to the sea. But there are a couple of issues about the Gaza Strip. First, what's the geographical area of Gaza Strip? Anyone knows it's not a very big one. Uh, it's about 25 mi miles in, in length and, and about 6 to 8 miles in, uh, in width. Very small one, 25 by 8. And uh, how many people live in there? About 1.8 million people. And uh, more than 70% of these people are refugees who were uprooted from the historical land of, uh, land of Palestine. So it's one of the areas that has uh, a very high density of population. And at the same time, it's occupied since the year 1967. <coughs> and it's the end of the siege, as Ron mentioned, since almost eight years. And that siege started uh, with a very brutal way. You know, many things that were not allowed to get into Gaza, including even children clothing, children shoes, uh, anything that you could imagine. And those 17 items that were initially allowed to get into Gaza were mainly uh, food items. Well, it's not uh, enough. There is, uh, there are all the time, you know, they come some uh, different agencies, international agencies, UN agencies that speak about the conditions in general in Gaza Strip. And all of them, whether you go back to 2002, 2004, 2006, 2008, all of them speak about uh, the difficulties and the life conditions, the living conditions of people in Gaza Strip. They speak about problems with water. The recent reports speak that or say that more than 90% of people in Gaza Strip do not have uh, access to clean uh, water that is good to, to, to for the children to drink. And they all the time raise the issues of the power supply, raise the issues of the reconstruction uh, issue and they raise different uh, uh, concerns about Gaza. And generally, they speak about a de-development that is taking place in that very small, tiny, tiny area in the Middle East. Well, it's not only like that, you know. On top of all of these people who were in Gaza, they were exposed to three different major operations, offensives, attacks. One of them was in 2008-9, one of them was in 2012, and the third one was in 2014. And when we speak about those three uh, uh, offensives, let's talk about the re most recent one, the one that ended about 14, 16 months ago. Uh, people say that, you know, different media resources say that more than 50,000 shells were falling in Gaza during 51 days. And those 50,000 shells, some of them were like airstrikes, some of them were artillery, some of them were tank shells. Some of them were just from the Navy, you know, all the types of shells that you could imagine, uh, they were used. And let's imagine like that, those 1.7 million people were in that very small geographical area, and there are almost 1,000 shells falling on that area on a daily basis. Half of the population of Gaza Strip, 52% are children. So something like 900,000 children live in that area. So let's imagine the continuous falling of those shells over the day and night. What would that look like? How would people under the occupation, under the continuous firing and chilling would feel? Of course, the feeling is very simple. You know, continuous feeling of fear, insecurity, helplessness, 
loss and imminent death. You know, the statistics that come about the number of people who killed all the time keep saying that 70% of the people who got killed or injured are just simply civilians. They are just simply uh, civilians. And what aggravated the condition is when the land operations started, which means that more than 500,000 people were displaced from their houses. 500,000 people were displaced to the other areas, you know, and here we are not, again, let's keep in mind the small geographical area and the already existing problems with, uh, with housing. It's not only like that, but there are some statistics, you know, that come with this. More than 2,000 people got killed, including 500 children. More than 11,000 people were injured, including 3,300 children. More than 818,000 uh, 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 residences were destroyed. I didn't predict that, no, it's still residents. So more than 18,000 residences were destroyed, fully destroyed. And this led to the 100, more than 100,000 people were simply without homes to return to homeless. Of course, in Gaza Strip, you know, in that culture, you do not find people sleeping in the streets, never. That's impossible to see. But those 100,000 people are basically living in some neighborhoods or with some of their relatives. And this, again, you know, impacting the lives of not only those 100,000 people, on, but also the other people who are living with. And then the question is, okay, you are a mental health professional. The question is, how do that impact the psychological, mental, or mental health well-being? I'm really glad to see uh, Brian Barber, who is sitting here. He is one of the most, you know, qualified people in research, and he done many research on Gaza Strip, and he could definitely help later on while we have the discussion. But here I bring just three small, three small uh, uh, paragraph sentences. UNICEF estimates like 370,000 children were in need for psychosocial support, and that was in August. That was the initial assessment of the situation uh, immediately after uh, uh, the ceasefire took place. The WHO, generally speaking, they say in areas of uh, emergency, 20% of the people might have mental disorders. We did a research in 2013, and that was one year following the 2012 attack, and we found out that 30% of the children who were exposed to high level of trauma were still having symptoms of PTSD, and they have some neurotic uh, uh, disorders. And the question is, <coughs> If that is the case, then who is going to help uh, uh, the people to provide the services? Well, there are mainly two institutions or two organizations that are capable of providing these services in Gaza Strip. The specialized care services, which are in the top of the pyramid of services that are usually provided to people in these areas. On top of them is the Ministry of Health and the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. So our institution works on top of that pyramid and tries to provide as much as possible care to those people who are victims of all these offenses. What makes us a little bit distinguished over the Ministry of Health is that we have the resources and capacity, skills, and training to work with children, which is very important issue when it comes to people in Gaza Strip. And let's all the time have in mind that we have more than 900,000 children. So what do we do? Here I would like to show you just a short video about the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. It's not a long one, two minutes. The video was made by one of our organizations that not our organization, it's called Just Act, and it's a UK based and they were raising some funds for the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. And they sent me an email, they said, okay, we made a video about you and we are putting it on our website so people would know to whom these donations are made. So I am taking this opportunity and showing the same video that they made about our work.
a very easy question is what would you do with a child? You know, children are not able of expressing themselves as adults do. You know, some of the terms that we use like disappointed, frustrated, they do not have that in their vocabulary. And you need to understand really what's wrong with the child. Why the child is awakened in the middle of the night and screaming, showing night horrors. Or why a child who is seven or eight years old started to wet his bed, you know. It's very strange. Or why someone who is in like in the sixth grade or seventh grade, his marks start to just uh, decrease. He's not good at schooling as he uh, used to be. Or why someone start to just not to discipline well. There should be a story behind those things. So how to do you find about this uh, story? Especially when a school counselor refers the child to you and you need to investigate and find out what's wrong and then ask yourself how to help. One of the very basic things that we do is that we have a play therapy room, you know, full of toys. You know, you get the child in and you say, say the child, you know, pick whatever toy you would like to play with. Some children would like to pick like a family structure and play, you know, the role of the father, the mother, the children. He might show that, you know, he feels some jealousy, you know, but other children will pick, will pick different issues. They will pick ambulances. They will pick maybe planes. They maybe will pick, you know something that they are afraid of or they would like to talk about and when they start talking they just talk about their fears you know they start to talk about what keeps their minds busy and then you invite the parents in you tell them simply your child is afraid of one two three four let's try together to find means of dealing with this feeling of insecurity or unsafety let's try to find ways of dealing with these fears you know the child comes for GCMHP clinic maybe one, two times per week. They spend two hours maximum. But the rest of the day, the rest of the time, they are with their parents. So you need to tell the parent that your child is misbehaving, not, bec not because he became a bad child, but because he is afraid of something, you know. So you go tell him a story before he goes to sleep. Then he might stop bedwetting. May then maybe he will just not wake up and scream in the middle of the night. So you involve the parents as much as possible in that therapeutic intervention. Sometimes this doesn't work. Children wouldn't even speak. So in that case, you invite them to draw something, you know. Pick a pencil, a crayon, and the paper and start drawing whatever comes to your mind. Fortunately, sometimes they come with these drawings, you know. It's very unfortunate that children who are like seven, eight, they come with these drawings. They draw the destruction that surrounds them. Unfortunately, until today, in many areas of Gaza Strip, you still walk and find piles of the destruction sites. You know, file piles of the rubble are not removed yet, and this is very challenging. How could you work with those children when those piles are still there? And let's all the time keep in mind that the Palestinian children aren't like any other child in the whole world. They deserve good education. They deserve to have good water. They deserve to have good and a good place to play. You know, it's not good that a child you know is playing in his partially destroyed house. He is a little bit lucky because some parts of his house are still there. But unfortunately, you see what's here, you know. Is this a good place for a child to play? It's not. But that's what he have. So amid all of this chaotic situation, you try to do a lot into adding some colorful memories to the minds of those children. If I ask anyone of the audience, you know, what is the earliest thing that you could ever remember about your life, you know? You would bring a memory, you know. Sometimes it's a good memory, sometimes it's a bad memory. But you will still something, remember something. I don't know in 10 years from now, my 11-year-old uh, uh, son, Muhammad, I don't know who, wh what he will remember. Maybe the 2008 war, he was 5. Maybe the 2011, 12, he was uh, 9. Or maybe the 2014 one, when he was 10. I don't really know which one he will uh, remember what memory he will think of, or what we, memory he will, will find out. So we try one way or the other to add colorful memories to the minds of children. And we do it in a very good way. You know, sometimes you make children sing, sometimes you make children dance, sometimes you arrange them folklore, you know, and sometimes, you know, despite the closure and the difficulty of us going out, the difficulty of everyone going out, even the uh, patients, you know, you try to invite some people from abroad, you know. And in this case, we invite Mikey Mouse, you see? He's not that man to the left, you know. He's just here. <laughs> so that is one of our professionals. And children are really happy. 
So you need all the time to do it one way or the other to keep the children smiling because hope is all the time comes from the children. And if we don't have hope in the children, <laughs> then we don't have hope in anything. So what I speak about is, is not quite known to many people in Gaza. So you need to talk more to the people, to tell them no, to let them know that if a child is misbehaving, doesn't mean that he needs more discipline, you know. Maybe he needs some mental health attention. So we go to speak about this in the neighborhoods, in the communities. And sometimes when this is not enough, and it's not enough, because it was large scale operation, you go to media outlets, you go to the radio, you go to the TV, you try to spread the news, you try to work against the stigma, you try to minimize it. And one way or the other, you try to bring one more time, you try to bring more hope to the people, you try to bring more smiles to the, to the faces, and this summarizes the work that we do in GCMHP. Just work as good as possible to bring these people hope and smile again. Uh, just one more word before the finish. It, it, it might sound that all of our clients are children. No, actually half of them are children. 50% is are adults. And, you know, as I see the faces here, I would like to say one more thing, that we don't lose hope in GCMHP. We make the population more hopeful, and we, if we feel hopeful in Gaza, then you shouldn't also lose hope. You should also be hopeful. And do you think in creative ways how to help the people in Gaza still. Thank you very much. It's the time to um, ask questions and have discussion. We'll start over there with uh, George Heshmay. Can you wait till you get the microphone so everybody can hear? Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, what is the purpose of your trip to the US? Are you fundraising, or are you going to tell people about it, and how are you doing it? Yeah. I mean, one thing that I, because I'm a journalist, I think you should write a column and offer it to one of the leading papers in the country, or many leading papers in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe you could give uh, Donna just a space to say a few words, just sure. one minute or two. Lucian, can you give Donna Sorry. the uh, microphone? Thanks. Um, I was the one who invited them. Um, so the uh, Rebuilding Alliance is a small nonprofit, and we work. Uh, we've been a partner with Gaza Community Mental Health f for many years. Um, we're the ones who rebuilt the home for Rachel Corey, for the family that Rachel Corey stood to protect, and her parents were our founding board members. So Gaza Community Mental Health had been our our, our partners, and in that we'd hoped to build so many more houses in that neighborhood. Um, when I heard last summer, um, you know, we'd, we'd been putting people on the radio and on conference calls with Congress, um, pe peacemakers from Gaza and from Israel. And, and when I heard what happened to Dr. Yasser's family, I called with condolences. And his uh, staff, who I know really well, I didn't know him, and they said, no, you have to talk with him and you have to have people hear him let them hear his voice and I didn't know how to how does one talk about he lost 28 members of his family in one bombing um, and I, I had no idea how to even begin that conversation but he was so eloquent that I knew um, that we had to bring him here and um, and it's no accident that he comes with Rand Goldstein these organizations have worked together since their founding um, so people needed to hear from both of them and to hear the work that they're doing, the insight they bring. We do, it is a fundraising tour. We have been raising money for, um, to advance the local clinics. There are two local clinics for Gaza Community Mental Health Program, and there's also the mobile clinics that um, Physicians for Human Rights brings to Palestine. Um, so we've, we've nearly met the fundraising goal. And today is our briefing in front of Congress at 1.30 in House Canon 129, uh, no, sorry, House Canon 121 is the room number. Um, it, it, this is about policy change too, because there's got to be some better message um, to people in Palestine, to people in Israel, that there's a way forward. And if if anyone can bring that message forward, it's it's these two speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, over here. Hi, 
Uh, my name is Pam Bailey. I have a project in Gaza called We Are Not Numbers. Um, and it's a project for young uh, developing writers, English writers, 17 to 29. So the older age group. And so I hear a lot of talk about um, children and their needs. But the challenge I have faced in working with, I have about 45 writers. Um, these are older kids. Um, I, I've um, encountered a lot of pretty severe mental health issues in terms of just, just depression. Of course, I've been told everybody in Gaza is depressed to some extent. But you know, I, I had one who um, you know, tried to commit suicide, et cetera, and I cannot get them to seek help. Um, they seem like there's a huge stigma against, um, I mean, it seems like it's okay for kids, but once you become an adult, it's not. Um, and it seems to stem from um, a total lack of trust. Um, I can't convince them that they would see a counselor and have it kept confidential. They, they're just, uh, they're convinced it would be shared with other people, and if people knew that they were seeking, uh, going to a counselor, they'd be seen as weak, uh, crazy, you know, bad thing. Um, the, I've had one kid, I was able to finally get, have him get therapy, and actually, do you know, you know Hossam al Matun, Very good friend of mine. Uh, he actually sort of tricked him into it <laughs> through drama therapy. And then he is finally seeing a therapist, but only by going to a coffee shop. He won't go to the clinic because he they won't give his name. So I guess my question to you is, is both how do we, and, and do you have any advice for people like me who talk to them online all the time, don't know what to tell them, don't know what to do, can't get them to seek help, um, how do we deal with the stigma? Thank you for raising this issue. Well, first of all, stigma is always there, you know. You need to be aware of it. And yeah, you need to be aware of it and you need to talk uh, uh, about it clearly. That's why we have big educational programs. These are like and awareness programs. Uh, but th there is another side of the story, you know, which is like when we were established in 1990, 0% of the people who visited GCMHP were self-referred, not family referred. They were just referred by the medical doctors or practitioners. But uh, 2014, 70% of the people who came to us were self-referred or, or family referred, which is, which is a relatively good improvement, but we are still aware of the difficulties that are there. Uh, for those who are hesitant or not capable of showing up, you know, we have a toll-free line that is available for people to call from Gaza Strip. And uh, most of the people who benefit from that are really uh, women. So 65% of the like 1,200 calls that we receive per year comes from, from, from females, but the remaining are from men. So they are more than free to, to, to try our telephone counseling uh, uh, line. When you mm -hmm. talk to them, uh, <coughs> I would advise that you do not directly tell them, go see a, a counselor. You can't keep stressing on that issue. It makes it more difficult to take the decision, okay? So you need just to, to talk to them and, and understand how, how their difficulties are coming. But um, if you keep like pushing towards uh, visiting a, a therapist, especially in that age group, they are more likely not to take to make that step. So they will do it by themselves with time when they feel that they are in need for that. But our telephone counseling is 1-700-222-444. It's quite known in, in Gaza Strip, and they can just phone. Uh, yes, over there, and then over there. Uh, I have a question for both of you, actually, is do you have lists of the medications that are short uh, with regard to the specific things that you're doing. And I, I realize that for Dr. Yasser, there's something more specific, perhaps for uh, Mr. Goldstein, it's more yeah. general, but still. We get the list from the Ministry of Health in, Ga in, in Ramallah, but they, they are in coordination with the one in Gaza. So yeah, there is a list. We get it every day almost, the shortage. So I think it, it, uh, probably you can find it publicly somewhere, but. Yes, we have those lists. And you get that once you recommend Yeah, yeah, we get it. We have a list of medications, mainly uh, psychotropic drugs, like medications that are u used for, for psychiatry. And uh, due to the conditions and, and, and the people who come to visit our services, uh, they receive the medications almost free of charge. And uh, we have a, a big list of medications. It's, I think, the main ones are like 17 or 18 medications. 
uh, over the last like four or five years, we used to buy medications for something like $90,000 a year, and we give them just free of charge. But in 2014, that you know, raised to, to increase to about $125,000, $125,000. And we keep to try raise funds to cover the medication. We buy the medication basically from, from the pharmacist, from the market. So, but unfortunately, because of the uh, uh, economic conditions of the people who come to us, most of that medication go free of charge. <coughs> 125000 a year, that's, yeah. I just want to add that it's uh, not only medication, it's also equipment. Disposables, for example. Yeah, I just wondered if um, you could comment um, on the situation with regard to nutrition um, that's affecting the Palestinians, because from what I think we hear, uh, the Israeli leaders have talked about they're being kept on a, uh, what was the horrible term, a strict diet. And cl I, I think it's pretty clear that if, if people aren't <coughs> receiving proper nutrition, um, a lot of health care efforts are not going to go very far. So I wondered if you could tell us what's, what the situation is there and what you might be um, doing um, to correct it. Um, but I did also um, want to comment that I find it um, very, very disturbing um, that not only here but um, among those who support Palestinian rights, generally in this country, the terminology continues to be used referring to what has been happening um, periodically the last several years as being a war whenever uh, there are these uh, ferocious bombing campaigns. And I think that that really makes a huge concession to the Zionist uh, propaganda machine. These are not wars. There is not parity in the resources. Uh, clearly, the Israeli uh, military is being bankrolled by um, the U.S., which is a major superpower, and it's up to us to stop it here, and as long as we are deluded and misguided or misled by this kind of terminology, um, there's no way that this, this horror is going to end. Um, we've got to get things straight here. You know, uh, the, from what we understand, the, um, there are internal pressures sometimes having to do with uh, unemployment and the need for, or the alleged need for land on the part of the Mizrahim and, and so on and so forth that drives some of these um, in, uh, bombing campaigns that happen each um, spring. There's always some pretext to unify um, the Israeli population, which is experiencing divisions. And this is just going to go on and on and on until we get clear. I mean, there's, there's no equation between the two sides and what's happening. I mean, this Thank is... Thank you. Well, uh, the health condition of children are not that uh, good in Gaza Strip for many reasons. It's, uh, you know, we have many, many children who are anemic. I don't really recall the, the percentage of children who are anemic, but uh, uh, we, we can find them on the internet if we search for that. But uh, uh, another problem is also uh, uh, the living conditions, you know. When you live in a good condition, then you need a certain amount of calories and a certain amount of vitamins, etc. But, but if you live in a very dangerous neighborhood, you know, when the remnants of explosives are there all the time, you know, I don't know how many tons of explosives were, were, were just thrown into Gaza Strip, but these children continue to live in there, you know, and you don't have access to clean water. So it's, it's more complicated than, uh, you know, it, I mean, it, it has many sides of it. No good water. The living conditions are very harmful. And then you have a problem with the nutrients, you know. And I don't think that the best way to deal with this issue is just to give children bags of, uh, of tablets that have minerals and, uh, and vitamins. It shouldn't be like that. We should just clean their environment and let them enjoy a healthy environment like all the children in, other in, 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 in the other places. And when uh, regarding using the terminology, you are right, yeah. I, I don't think that... Uh, an occupier will have war with someone who is occupied. I mean, when you are under occupation and you are struggling, you cannot be at war with the occupier. But anyway, these are the terms that are used by, by many media, unfortunately. Um, over here, and then... Would it be fair to characterize the situation of children in Gaza 
who come to your center as survivors of torture. And related to that, most people are familiar with treatment of PTSD and other phenomena for people who have left the area where the trauma occurs. It's very unusual to find places where the trauma continues on a daily basis and even intergenerational trauma. And have you developed special techniques in, in Gaza? Huh. Okay, so this is a question that is asked in, uh, in, in, in many places and it's very simple. Trauma as it's uh, understood or how, as it's taught in the, in the American Psychiatric Association and all these international texts, they speak about, you know, good conditions, you know, suddenly a traumatic event takes place and then people jump and help and then things reverse, you know. It's not like that in Gaza, it's not like that at all because there is no pre. The pre could be the 2014 or 11 or uh, 12 or 9. And sometimes people come with memories that, you know, uh, remind them of different traumatic events that took place in four different, like, uh, uh, dates. And when it comes to the post, we don't have post because actually until now, only 1,000 houses of those 18,000 started, not rebuilt yet, but the reconstruction started. And if it took them one th year to just begin 1,000 or 2,000 units, the question is how much time it will take them to uh, uh, rebuild the 18,000 uh, residences. So for us mental health professionals, we see that happening all the time. You know, we see people coming with uh, re-experiencing traumatic events that took place in 2014 and some of them in 2008. One of our uh, uh, professionals, you know, it was very interesting. She 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 works with the mobile teams that go intervene in the communities. And uh, in 2014, you know, she was just walking in one of the neighborhoods, you know, just heading to see how how families are doing. And suddenly a 14-year-old girl just ran into her and, 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 and just started hugging her. And say she told him, I'm waiting you since one week. It took you one week to come to us. Why is that? That girl was treated by that professional in 2009. And in 2014, she was just waiting for her to show up again. And that girl has her house fully destroyed. And in that house... You know, her family noticed that she was just like walking around trying to find things. And when they told her, what are you looking for, you know? She said, this uh, sabah, you know, anti-sabah, as, as, as she says, she gave me a toy and I want to find that toy, you know. It was a little doll that our professional gave her in 2009. She kept that doll with her. And in 2014, when the house was destroyed, she tried to find it. Well, luckily she found that doll. And she told her, look, I still have it, it's here, it's with me. So this one way or the other, you know, um, we are extremely connected to our community. Many of us encountered many losses during the offensive, you know. I lost 28 members of my extended family. Some of our people lost their brothers, some lost their mom, you know. But we all went back and we believe that what we do is the right thing and that that community deserves to continue to have hope and to continue to work for the better future. And we feel that we are doing the right thing, you know, and we find those hopes and we see children improve. And this keeps us really working. But it's not easy, but we are doing it, you know. We are, we are still there, you know. We are still there. This is different. Brian, yeah. Hi, I'm Brian Barber. I'm a fellow at New America, a think tank here in D.C. in order to write a book on Gaza. It's so delightful to see you here on our turf, Yasser, um, and good to meet you, Ram. You may not remember this, but about a year ago, we sat on the terrace of El Dira, where Yad. Yeah, I remember that well, you know. <laughs> where Yad likes like to meet, and we had a great talk. I was on my way to London to give an address to the UK Palestinian Mental Health Net Network, and I knew they were going to ask me, just coming from Gaza, what this was just after the war, what, what does Gaza need most for mental health? You didn't hesitate to say uh, immediately remove the siege. So apart from the traumas of the wars, I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit more about how that political and economic reality, which we somehow disentangle from mental health too often, yeah. really works its way 
into the mental health of people. Thank you for raising this issue. Uh, I was talking to one of our projects officer like about a month ago, a couple of months ago, and I told him, just give me the statistics about the children, what are the disorders they come with. And he said, 50% come with post-traumatic stress disorder. I said, come on, is this right? We are like nine months after it. Is it still this the case? He said, I think yes. He said, okay. You go back and you divide the data into uh, periods. One is until the end of December 2014, and then you bring me the first six months of 2015. And unfortunately, when it comes to adults, almost nothing, to children, I mean, almost nothing changed. You know, like 50% of the children who were coming to our com community centers were having PTSD, but now it's a little bit better, 45%. But on the other hand, the number of bedwetting cases increased. So in total, they come to something like about 60%. And, and it shows that nothing really improved on the ground because, because people continue to suffer because the conditions continue to be almost the same. So unless there is a political will to change the living conditions of Gaza Strip from just the development, you know, and they should at certain moments say, okay, it's enough, let's allow those people to live. No one is really allowing Gazans to live at the moment. People are making our lives more and more difficult. Uh, the siege. You know, less than 9% of the reconstruction material was allowed to get into Gaza until the 19th of October 2015. Less than 9%. So the question, does it take, would it take us another, like, how many years? 10 years? 10 more years in order to just rebuild what was destroyed? And this is a very simple uh, uh, statistic to show that the blockade is still working, it's doing its, bell, its best, it's rendering our development, not only development, but restructuring, you know, like frozen. And at the same time, you know, people who have problems in leaving Gaza, coming into Gaza, traveling, you know, even patients, uh, students who need to travel abroad, they are not enjoying that possibility, you know. So we could at least begin from lifting the blockade because it's the only way that you will allow people to recover. Now, I am not requesting lifting the blockade in order to develop Gaza Strip, no. The request is now is lift the blockade to allow people recover. If the blockade is not going to be lift, recovering is not going to happen. Unless we will continue to stay for 100 years, you know, with this reconstruction slowly mechanism and maybe people will be able to recover if granted that no more attacks are going to take place. I think we have time for just one more question, so. Hi, um, can you please talk a little bit more about uh, the effects trauma has had on families, especially in terms of social cohesion and stress on relations? Yeah. So social cohesion is one of the most important moderating factors like that help the people survive during those very difficult and tough uh, times. But it's very important to have in mind that if you have a strong social network in Gaza, it doesn't mean that people will continue to be forever resilient. You know, Over the years, people are depleted of their resources economic, financial, you know, farming land, uh, their own buildings, their own houses. You know, it's like in the States, when you need to build your own house, you might go into, you know, a, a loan for 30 years, or you make a saving for 30 years, and you then you build it. Suddenly, it's not there, you know. It's in one second, and that house is not there. And the question is, how would that stay? Many people are running out of these resources. That's why we have more cases coming to our community centers immediately after and still to be the case after 2014. So resilience is there. We have many moderating factors, but the problem is that people with time, the resources are really depleting. I'd like also to add, if, if you allow me, you know, I have Dr. Bill Slaughter, who's a psychiatrist from Boston. He is the president of the Gaza Mental Health Foundation. If you go build GCMHP, you might end up finding Gaza Mental Health Foundation, which is a US-based uh, organization. And sometimes people get confused, so they, they write to me, but the email goes to them, or, or that happens the opposite. But 
if just one or minute for, for Bill to say something, and then I, I would be, be thankful. Can you hold on? This is Yasser's first trip. Can you hold on one second? This is Yasser's first trip to the US. Uh, we are uh, doing both kind of advocacy, as you suggested, sir, as well as fundraising. But it's really a, a initial networking tie building. Yasser gets much more support from Europeans. Um, and directly from European governments who understand the, the critical role of keeping civil society vibrant and uh, as healthy as possible in the Strip. Our government doesn't play that role in Gaza, as you know very well. It's up to us in civil society to do that, but we need much more networking and much more support here. So please be in touch as you can, both on the advocacy and on the funding donation side, as well as training and research that Brian's been so involved with. Thanks. Well, on that note, I'll say that um, I, I think you will stay with us for the next 15 or so minutes. So if people would like more information, they can talk to Dr. Bill Slaughter. I'd like to thank him, and I'd like to thank Donna very much, Donna Bransky walker for uh, organizing this tour and agreeing to come here. We were kind of a last-minute um, thought, and we I was delighted that you accepted our request to come here. Um, I think I can speak for everybody here and those online. Um, I'd like also to thank so much our two speakers, Ron Goldstein and Dr. Yasser Abu Jama, for um, enlightening us about what's going on and for your incredible work despite all the huge challenges. Um, and thank you, Dr. Yasser, for managing to have hope and to, to give us hope. Thank you very much. <laughs>